All right, we are ready to begin our second panel of the day. Uh, a very important topic that we're going to discuss, which is how companies are failing trans, trans and queer employees. This conversation will be moderated by Elliot Vaughn, MBE, who is a managing director and senior partner at BCG, and he's going to start by presenting the results of a BCG study on the matter. Uh, and then we'll move into a panel with Emily Hamilton, who is a director at Trans in the City, Liam Clank, who is a TGNC lead for the EMEA region at BCG, Dr. Peter Dunn, who is a senior lecturer at the University of Bristol, and Roger Thompson, who is the head of internal audit at ICG. So help me welcome them to the panel. Let's get started. Thank you. Thank you very much, Abe. And um, please shove me if I'm not talking close enough to the microphone at any point. So. Uh, it's a, first of all, it's an absolute pleasure to be here at Year Out 2023. Uh, and I say that as a proud London Business School alum. Uh, it's always wonderful to come back. MBA 2005 starts to feel like a, a little while ago. I know we have a very international group as well beyond London Business School. So uh, welcome all of you to uh, this year's conference. Um, as I was saying, I'm a senior partner at uh, BCG. I'm the people chair for BCG's business in Europe, the Middle East, uh, South America, and Africa. Uh, and I'm also the founder and chair of Give Out uh, and co-chair of Outright International, uh, both charities working to improve uh, the lives of LGBTQI people around the world. Um, as Abe was saying, the format of this hour, we'll start with um, uh, uh, some findings from a recent study uh, that, that BCG conducted, which I think um, hopefully will be of great interest to this group. Um, and uh, the panel title is How Companies Are Failing trans and queer employees. Uh, we do need to talk about that, but we also want to talk about what does better look like and how do we get to that? <coughs> how can we make the workplace experience better for trans people, for other non-binary people, and for queer people more broadly? Um, so to start us off, um, I, I want to share some uh, findings from uh, a recent key landmark study that the BCG uh, conducted. Um, and let me first of all introduce um, the, the study. Um, uh, if we go on to the next page, or I can, yeah, thank you very much, yeah. Um, so, as far as we know, this is the largest study of this kind uh, to have taken place so far with, in the workplace setting. So we had over 2,000 trans and non-binary and gender non-conforming individuals globally uh, across eight different key markets around the world as part of a panel of a much larger panel, which included an additional 2,200 cis LGB respondents and an additional 2,200 uh, other respondents. So we have a really fascinating and rich data set from there. We worked with, uh, we did depth interviews uh, to, to really deepen our understanding of the findings. And we also uh, worked with key members of BCG's um, trans and, and gender non-conforming uh, and non-binary council internally and external community uh, leaders as well. Um, so let's show you uh, some of the uh, findings and, and get, get uh, a little bit of facts on the table, which hopefully the panel can also uh, respond to. Um, one of the places I, I want to start here is um, how important it is actually to be open and out in the workplace for the people who choose to do that. And this is uh, the findings across the trans and non-binary respondents to, to that study. Uh, and this is showing really the very, very deep beneficial effects of uh, being open in the workplace. And, you know, I, I summarize this as it's, it's about life joy. It's about, it's, it's as big as that. It's about a feeling of deep, deep authenticity at work, a uh, degree of comfort, and uh, which, which actually creates psychological safety. And that psychological safety creates the space to perform as well at work. So that means uh, being you know, innovative, productive, all of these things that um, we would hope for and expect. Um, I think that's a really, I start there because I, I just want us to remember that when we get into the discussion of all of the challenges and, and we, we certainly would not try to uh, represent that it's the right choice for everyone to be open and out at work um, or that it's easy to do that in every jurisdiction. And, and actually that's, I think, one of the things we really want to focus on um, in, in the discussion today. But this is an important anchor point. So then, what else did we find? We also found 
that actually not that many trans and non-binary respondents are in fact out at work. Um, and I think that's coming up on the next page. Um, and the average is coming in at around 29% across the different markets. You can see there is quite a variation in some of the markets. Here in the UK, we have a particularly adverse public environment for uh, trans people in particular at the moment, um, that we're, we're coming in bang on that average. And that compares to uh, BCG studies uh, looking at LGB, cis, LGBT, L LGB folk uh, coming in more in the sort of 60% range, 60 to 70% range uh, in general, uh, in terms of level of openness. And we find, we find that this is quite different as a starting point here for uh, the trans and non-binary community at work in those countries. And then we also dug into that and said, okay, well, when you think about being open at work, who are you most comfortable actually sharing with and being open with? And, and that's summarized in, it's, it's a bit of a dense table, but let me show it to you. And um, we asked people to rank order, and you can see at the top of this table, we've got junior workers and senior workers, the LGBTQ <coughs> network, peers, direct manager, and then the HR team at the bottom. And actually, I think it was a surprise to us as we conducted this, but also a very clear finding across these markets that the HR function actually comes out quite badly in this table. And, um, and we heard that as well in the depth interviews that we conducted, that actually there's quite a lot of um, latent fear and concern around uh, being disclosive and open with uh, HR colleagues. And so I think that's something that we should also address as, as part of our discussion today, how can uh, the people team or the HR team in companies actually be more uh, more progressive in, in actually moving this forwards rather than be seen to be a blocker. Um, now, I think during the break, we were also sharing up on the screen um, a question, and many of you responded on the Mentimeter with the QR code. Thank you for, for giving your, um, your responses there. And we had a a set of, I think, 13 statements, which you know we can call aggressions, microaggressions. I think actually most of them are fairly substantive aggressions um, in the workplace about feeling coerced into hiding your identity or using um, a particular type of bathroom uh, or actually worse than that, sexual, sexual uh, harassment and, and things which are really uh, very acute in terms of things to experience at work. Uh, and we asked you, how many of those have you experienced in the last year, either in your workplace or in your school environment? And uh, I think we, I think if the power of technology is with us today, then we might have um, a summary of the results here. Um, so, which is amazing, we do have a summary of the results. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, so this is saying, out of that set of 13 statements, um, it looks to me here like essentially three quarters of the group uh, are saying they've experienced one to four of those. And to be fair, I don't think we actually included less than one uh, as a response option. So I think we have to sort of none to four um, is three quarters of the, of the group. And then you can see 10 plus, we're into you know, a clear minority. So less than 10% of the respondents in this room. Okay, so let's now see what the findings were from the study that we, we did across these different markets, which is on the following page. So the, the blue on this page is 10 plus, and the percentage of trans non-binary respondents is the base of this table. Um, the, the darker green is five to nine, and then the one to four, which was the big, the, the big bar on the previous page, is the light green here. And so what you can see, there's a clear average across the responses that 80% of trans and non-binary colleagues are experiencing five plus of the, the things on that list uh, of 13. Um, and actually, the largest response here is actually 10 plus. Um, I mean, I think it's worth just taking a moment to reflect on that. And when we, when we first saw these findings, and Liam was part of the, the, uh, the panel that was uh, doing this, this, this research, it's been published in the Harvard Business Review, I think we all were quite stunned and actually upset and, and really, you know, it was quite an emotional toll on the team doing mm. this work, just to contemplate, you know, <coughs> 10 plus of those harms in the last year as an average, as an average across all of those markets consistently. So I, I, I come to this data, I, that's why I wanted to start with the data first, which is why is it valuable to be open and out in the workplace? Because I think clearly the, the deep, deep life joy that comes from being authentic is something that, you know, I think we can all relate to. Um, 
But I think we also have to have this reality in our minds as well um, when, we, when we reflect on some of the challenges. And it's not just a UK challenge, it's an international challenge. Um, and maybe with that, I think actually we can come over to our panel because we actually have a fantastic panel um, for this discussion. We're, we're not seeking to be totally focused on a trans and non-binary experience, but I think it's clearly um, a, a really, really you know, visceral and salient part of the data that we've got um, that, that we want also to, to react to. But it, it's, it's also more broadly, you know, how can we queer the workplaces that we're all part of in our careers and hopefully be more fulfilled in our lives and our careers as a result. So now, without any further um, introduction, let, let's come to the panel. And I think um, it would be good to just have maybe a, a slightly longer introduction in terms of what's your personal relationship and professional <coughs> relationship to this topic. And um, uh, I should have said as we got going, my, my pronouns are he, him. Perhaps if you could also share your identities as well uh, as, we, as we do the intros. And maybe Emily, we could start with you. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Emily Hamilton. Uh, I've got a few hats I wear. My pronouns are she, her. Uh, I have a few hats I wear. So I have a day job, which is Vice President of Strategic Change at a FTSE 100 distribution organization. Uh, and in gay job terms, I'm Director of Trans in the City, which is the world's largest business network organization for uh, trans and non-binary inclusion at work. Um, I also founded the world's first and so far only LGBTQ plus supporters associations in world professional rugby at Harlequins, um, which yeah, I'm not sure if that's a job or not. It shouldn't have been. Um, and, and my relationship to this is I, I'm a very proud out uh, bisexual trans woman. Um, I came out at work four and a half years ago now, um, having uh, cowered in the closet for the first 37 years. Um, of my life. So knowing I was trans at the age of six, uh, I waited till I was 43 to be able to be safe enough to come out, which is uh, one of the reasons I work in the way I do is to make sure that other people don't feel they have to do the same thing and also that they have a place at work that they can be safe, authentic and themselves. Thank you. Liam, it's wonderful to see you again, and, uh, and uh, be, please uh, be great to hear from you next. Yeah, hello, good morning, everybody. So my name is Liam. I work for the Boston Consulting Group in Zurich. My day job is management assistant, which keeps me very busy since I'm working for 10 managers. Um, and the very important other job I have with BCG is that I am the EMEA lead for everything related to transgender and non-conforming. And my very personal, I mean, this, this whole topic is very close to my heart because, um, I mean, I'm 52 now and I transitioned when I was around 22 and my entire life has pretty much been a minefield trying to navigate different jobs, different employers. I worked in 11 different countries, in four different industries and yeah, there were a lot of aggressions and there were a lot of moments when I was openly asked, oh yeah, it's okay that you're a transgender, but just don't tell anybody. And um, so it's been an odyssey and uh, it's taken me all this time in all my life to finally get to a place in my professional life where I can feel safe being out at work. And so yeah, this is a very personal subject for me. Thank you. Peter. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Peter Dunn, so I'm a uh, he, him. Um, uh, I'm at the University of Bristol. Uh, so I started my career uh, probably more years than I'd like to admit um, as a human rights advocate in the States, ironically actually at Outright, um, when it was called Igleherk. Um, and then, uh, as is well known, those who can do, those who can't teach. So I became an academic. Um, and my work looks at how the law interacts generally um, with issues of sexual orientation, uh, gender identity, gender expression, and a little bit at, at sex characteristics. Um, so I'm particularly interested in how does law not just protect people, but in some ways kind of shape their identities. Uh, so I'm quite a bad employee and don't teach at the moment. I mainly do research. So I'm doing a, a kind of a seven-year project, which is trying to look at how does the law 
in the United Kingdom specifically, but more generally in Europe, accommodate um, conceptions of gender? Um, does it? Can it? Um, so my contribution today will probably be A, more boring, and B, more abstract, but I'm really uh, delighted to be here and to share the panel um, with people who I think are really gonna, I'm really looking forward to the discussions. Thanks. Thank you. It's, it's hard to go last, Roger, after that, this group, but Roger, uh, great to hear from you as well. Excellent. Well, firstly, good morning, everybody. And I just want to take the opportunity to say thank you for having me here. This is such an incredible event, uh, really important. And certainly when I was a student many years ago, I don't think these things sort of existed. So please enjoy the panel. Um, the reason why I think the panel is important to me is two things. One, I also want to learn and educate myself. You know, it's a journey. Um, I'm a uh, gay man. Um, I've only really started to take on a little bit more of these sort of advocacy roles in the last year. I'm the co-chair of our LGBTQ network. Um, but I think it's also important because, uh, you know, whilst corporates, they've got so much influence and power and resources that we can really uh, find ways to sort of change the world. They can drive policy and, and help people to sort of uh, build careers. And, you know, part of building a career they then can get back to those that come after them as well. And then also just on a personal note, I think this panel is quite interesting for me. I have a young family member <clears throat> who's at the start of their sort of journey around gender nonconformity. And when they get to the workplace in, in a couple of years time, I wanna make sure that they can also find and build a career where they can be authentic and uh, you know, follow whatever their path takes them. So thank you. Thank you. So, so let's start with the question of what's, what's your view on what's going wrong? What's the problem here? And, and maybe we can start with Emily and then Peter just to get the ball rolling um, with, with some initial perspectives. Uh, what's going wrong? Um, lots of things are going wrong. I, I think if, if you look at it from a UK lens, and I know we'll, we'll think of it more internationally, and, and this does count for more countries than just here, uh, we are we are basically in the middle of a sort of moral panic and a, and a backlash uh, against the trans and uh, non-binary community. And, um, you know, if you look at root causes, we know those, those bad actors, those, those people of ill will towards the broader LGBT community um, have seized upon trans and non-binary people as a means to divide the community and a means to roll back things they've disapproved of um, over a number of years. Um, and what you have is a confluence, I think, of circumstances, and, and you know, I'm giving an opinion here, um, that you have uh, economic issues in countries, you have uh, international tensions. <clears throat> it is a story as old as time to look for a scapegoat, to look for a small community, ideally one you don't see very often, you don't interact with very often, uh, and promote them as being the cause of some of your issues. So certainly in this country in the last year, <clears throat> there have been in excess of 8,000 mainstream newspaper articles which are anti-trans in character. <clears throat> so what you have are people being fed this narrative day after day after day that there's something wrong with being trans, there's something wrong with having trans people included at work. Um, and that starts then to interact with companies and, and your, your, your findings around HR kind of didn't surprise me, I have to say, um, because companies are by nature uh, risk averse, you know, organizations do try to avoid people risks particularly um, and what's happening is they're seeing a picture of something being more risky than it is. Um, you know, I'm here to say it isn't risky to have trans people working for you, it's quite the opposite, it's something which really improves your bottom line, but companies are frightened. Uh, they see backlash, they see media storms, they see all of the things that go on and actually they step away from that inclusion. Um, and then that puts all the burden onto the trans and non-binary employees. A leadership gap from the top. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. <coughs> Interesting. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, 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 not at all. I mean, I think, I think that is the thing. It becomes a gap, then becomes a chasm. Um, and the ability to come out, I mean, again, looking at your findings and having read the paper, you know, my process of coming out four years ago, it was terrifying. You know, I'm vice president of a business. You know, I'm talking to people all the time. You know, I've got a massive P&L to run. And yet I was absolutely sweating before I picked the phone up to my boss, who, who was out of the country, to say, I've got something to tell you. And, and this was a, two weeks after my last and hopefully final suicide attempt. 
which is something we all live with within the trans community, that the sort of mental struggles of being trans. Um, it, it was not an easy process. And, and then having to do the little black book thing of phoning, phoning all my team or sitting down with my team and saying, oh, I've got something to tell you. There's a, hey, surprise. Um, you know, I, I can make light of it now, but at the time, it, it wasn't a joke. And of course, you're doing that at the same time as family, at the same time as friends, um, at the same time as everything else that's going on in the world. COVID came along just after, completely ruined my plans. Really rubbish for a professional project manager. I had a Gantt chart and everything for transition. Absolutely blown out of the water by that. Um, but yes, the environment, even though there were some policies there, even though, you know, the, the leadership of my business were saying they were inclusive, matching that into action and, and a psychologically safe place for somebody just to, you know, in some ways it shouldn't be that big an issue just to say, I am who I am and, and I'd like a bit of support as I get used to that and I replace my wardrobe and sort myself out and, you know, let my hair grow out, all of those sorts of things, you know, which, which were denied to me before. So there is that massive gap um, and then HR teams who just want to look at what's the policy say? What's the frame? What's all legally? What happens here? Well, we, we've got to be better than that. Thank you. Thank you. And, and so that's, I think, a very um, you know, deep reflection then from a, from a UK experience. I think you know, I'm conscious we have you know, London Business School and then also Euro Out is very, very international in its orientation. So, you know, Peter, I think your, your work is look, you know, looking across many countries. Could, could you help us? get a bit of a, a grounding here from a, a, a more international perspective. What's your perspective on what the challenges are? Yes, yeah, so I think that, so obviously the statistics um, that you found are shocking, but I don't think they're surprising. So I think that's the way of looking at it. And I think this is a case of law being necessary, but not adequate. So if we look at law being necessary, if we look globally, and you've in, it's interesting, the countries that you've picked in terms of legal protections are actually not that bad. So there's both either legislative and laws or judicial, you just had court decisions where there's been a level of protection. But I think the first thing to note is that if we're thinking about why are companies not doing things around the world, and the statistics that you've shown, the data you've shown are just, are reproduced in various different areas, be it employment law, around the world. And one of the reasons companies aren't doing things is well because there's no legislative framework to require them to do that. So I think the first thing we would say is, well, how are we going to address this issue? Well, the first thing you need to do is to make companies actually address this. And so I wouldn't want to kind of, I think it's interesting the countries that have been picked, but if we just take a step back and look globally, the vast majority of jurisdictions don't have non-discrimination protections which apply to trans people in employment. So if you don't have that baseline level floor, then it's gonna be really hard to make substantive change. I think the second thing though you need to think about is that law is necessary, but it's not adequate. And I think this is where your data is really interesting, right? Because as I say, these are countries where have, which have a certain level of legislative protection, and yet we still see these really high levels of discrimination or feeling of uh, non-inclusion within the workplace. And so then, where are we going wrong? Well, there's, I think, two things there. There's a kind of a state role, and then there's the company role, and the company role is the really important one. The state role is knowledge and enforcement, right? So it's all very good to have these laws which cover people, but actually, if nobody knows about them, if individual employees don't know about these laws, or more importantly, if they're not actually enforced, right? If they don't mean anything, if you can't go to court for a variety of reasons to enforce these, that's important. But actually, what's really important is, are companies, A, aware of their responsibilities? Are senior management and HR aware of their responsibilities? Are companies doing, some, are they doing things to actually inform themselves, but more importantly, their employees, about what those responsibilities are? And I actually think that's maybe one of the things we don't think about enough, which is that we all assume the existence of a legislative framework can be really important. But for companies, the big thing that you can do is you can actually take steps to ensure that in the company itself, these legislative protections actually have meaning. And I think the final thing I would say is that we're, you know, the absence of a legal framework doesn't stop companies themselves from taking other measures. That's really interesting. Again, coming to that question of what, what the leadership role could be there beyond uh, a legal minimum. And um, <clears throat> maybe bef before going to, to Roger and, and Liam on this question, but um, 
Peter, you, you mentioned that there are, you know, generally an absence of uh, state legal protections for trans uh, workers. Is the same true in your experience, you know, for non-binary um, uh, people with those identities and also um, queer people more broadly? So it depends upon it depends upon really the jurisdiction that you're thinking about. It depends upon where in the world you're working. Um, so okay, so let's I'll take the second of those questions first. Um, in Europe, across the European Union, ironically enough, there are more countries that have protections in relation to trans people than they are than there are um, individuals who might experience discrimination because of sexual orientation. The only reason I say that is because the gender ground in EU law has been interpreted to uncover trans individuals. And so it applies to employment, sale of goods, it applies to a variety, so, um, to a variety of areas. Whereas sexual orientation only protects areas of employment. So across Europe, we actually see wider protections in relation into gender. I think the issue around enforcement, though, is, is different, right? So I think there's a lot more people who who are experienced, experiencing discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and who feel more capable of enforcing those rights. I think the, second, the first aspect of your question was, well, are there protections for people who are non-binary? And I think that's a big question, right? Because the question is whether or not, where we don't have an express protection for gender identity, we might have an express, we might have a protection for, say in the UK, the protected characteristic is gender reassignment. And that's actually a characteristic that we see often in Europe. There's a question as to whether or not that covers people who are non-binary, gender fluid, gender queer. Um, and so that's something that we just need more clarity on either from lawmakers on or more clarity from courts. But that's a real kind of, in terms of really boring legal analysis, that's an interesting question at the moment as to whether or not these protections stress. That's why it's really important that when we're adopting protections, we specifically focus on gender identity and gender expression. Thank you, that's really clear, thank you. R Roger, I'd love to come to you on this question of the, the leadership gap that we've been hearing about. And you know that could be C-suite, it could be you know, ally leaders who are just not really using their voices. It could be functions like HR. Um, I, you know, what, what's been your experience? And then perhaps after that, Liam, just some reflections from you on this topic of, you know, what mm -hmm. the challenges are as well, your personal reflections there. Mm -hmm. as well. Thank you. Sure, I think the, the first point I would sort of want to make is I don't want to reduce all of this down to numbers and data, right? Because I think sometimes, you know, 3% of this and 7% and 10%, well, actually, we are people with feelings, thoughts, dreams, hopes, and aspirations. But we do need visibility, though. And I think when you look at the sort of the C-suite across the FTSE 100 and even the Fortune 1000, there are not a lot of people that identify with the, the LGBTQ plus community. They're just, there's really, and, and off the top of my head, the only one that I can think of is Tim Cook from Apple. And he's been in that role for years, right? So. You kind of have to sort of say to yourself, you know, why are we not getting people at that level? Is there something that's sort of blocking them or, you know, people just sort of focusing, right, they can do these jobs, but they can't get to that sort of senior thing. But what is interesting in your study or the study that was done um, is actually a lot of those sort of senior people got quite a positive uh, response in terms of people they can trust. Uh, so which I thought was quite an interesting thing, but yet people struggled with their line managers. Um, and a lot of people, and you know, it wasn't just one region where people sort of said they felt uncomfortable telling the person that looks after you in your job. And I kind of wonder, again, is that from a corporate perspective because maybe line managers don't have the skill set? Are we not changing the way people think? Uh, you know, or is it just that sort of line managers, oh, oh, I have to fill in your appraisal form and you know, give you your bonus check if you get one? Um, and I think this is a sometimes a shift in, 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 in you know, policy and, and legislation is obviously very important as well. But I think, how do we shift people's sort of thinking to just realize that actually, these are people that want to be, you know, achieving a career. They want to educate, they're smart, they're intellectual, they read, you know, we're in a university today. And the fact is that we don't want to just sort of break it down to just, oh, you know, you fit into this category or that letter. And I think that's probably sometimes where there's a bit of that leadership gap. You know, it's very great, you know, CEO gets a great diversity report. Oh, great, we've made the stats, you know, 50% woman or whatever the numbers are. But actually, are we doing enough that we can sort of actually transfer through, you know, through the organization that people sort of feel comfortable and, and be inspired to aspire, is what I would say. Thank you. Thank you. Liam. 
Yeah, I would uh, actually love to connect to what you said about line managers, because I think, I mean, quite naturally, the line manager is the one person you're closest to in your work environment and the one person who can most directly influence your career at that moment. And I think one thing that's really missing, it all sort of hinges around communication, education and policies. And often in companies, in my experience, the problem is you are really depending on the individual because there is no clear policies in place yet. And then the problem is, you know, okay, you have a feeling for your line manager who that person is. You realize mm, they're a little bit LGBTQIA phobic maybe. So then of course you're not gonna feel comfortable talking with that person because you know it sort of hinges on his individual judgment of you and there is the danger that maybe he or she or they will confuse your competence with your identity. And that is a really, really big problem and uh, probably one of the reasons why people are so uncomfortable. And same probably with HR. I mean, I noticed that personally at the moment, I mean, at BCG in Zurich, I, I'm very lucky at the moment to have fabulous line managers who support everything I do and every single time I ask, oh, I need to go do this panel for Pride at BCG, is that okay? They're like, yeah, yeah, sure, take the time. You know, it's wonderful. And, um, and also our HR department is amazing, but I am always at the back of my mind nervous because I know these people won't stay there forever. And I know that there is no clear policies protecting me. It's these people that are protecting me, these individuals. Um, and another thing I've noticed over the years is it's just so important to keep talking about these subjects very often, very in depth. I've worked for a long time, for example, for the entertainment industry, uh, specifically large scale circus shows like Cirque du Soleil. And one thing that struck me there was that they were always like, oh, we don't need to talk about these things. We're so diverse. We have people from 70 different countries and from all kinds of backgrounds. No reason to talk about diversity. And it was, in fact, the most toxic work environment I ever experienced because of the fact that we didn't ever mention these things. We didn't put them on the table. So there, were, there was no infrastructure. There was no ombuds person you could go to. There was nobody in HR who could help you if you were being bullied or if you had any specific needs. So I think that's something that go is still being done wrong in many companies that they're just, it's, it's not out there. We're not openly talking about the subject and because we're not, there is this dark corners, there are these dark corners where you can get hurt, where you all of a sudden are, you, are not safe and sort of at the, at the will of the situation. Some very serious topics we're talking about today, but it's great. It's great to get this range of perspectives. Um, I do want to ask, what what does good, or if not good, what does better look like, and and how can we get there? And um, I mean, at, at BCG we have this frame that we we use, where you know we prioritise first of all safety, and then psychological safety, and then we think about, you know, how can people advance and and be retained, um, you know, in in equal in an equal way uh, and a fair way. How can people find community, actually, at work and, and really feel fulfilled? Uh, and actually then going beyond that, have a positive impact externally in the world as well. So that's the sort of the, the steps in the, the, the ladder that we think about. Um, but you know, Emily, I'm struck by how um, stark <laughs> the perspective was that you were sharing at the beginning. But you know, what, how do you think about you know, what, what good or better looks like? Yeah, I mean, it, it can be stark. And, and, and you know, I've got to be careful. I mean, it's, it, this happens to be Trans Awareness Week, so we, we are trying to sort of uplift uh, with what we say. But I think if you're building an inclusive environment and, and remembering that inclusion for trans non-binary people, queer people, actually building an inclusive environment for everybody, you can't, you can't kind of pick and choose your strands of inclusion, you know, by definition. So I think organizationally, you build it in layers like anything else. And it, and it does start with policy frameworks. It starts with manuals and procedures and, and making sure that you have got that firm footing so people know 
you know, things are starting from solid ground. But that's not enough, and a lot of companies will do that. They will take a templated um, inclusion policy, transition policy, dignity at work policy, you know, brush their hands off and say, all done and dusted, and wait for the grievances to roll in, um, which, you know, is not a sensible thing to do. You have to take it to the next layer. You have to take it to what does that mean in practice, you know, what, you know in, in the very specific example of trans people. What do you do when you get the phone call from Emily on a Friday afternoon that says, got something to tell you, I'm transitioning and this is what's happening? Don't be wrong footage. You've got to have management levels who are comfortable with being uncomfortable because it's not an easy conversation, but they're not caught on the hop. They're not putting it all back on the person who's probably going through the most intense period of their life. Uh, from the HR perspective, you know, they've got to be more than just interpreters of the, of the policy. You know, they're, they're not arbiters. You know, HR teams are not, you know, judge, jury, and executioner. Well, that was in the policy. That's not in the policy. You know, the H in HR is, stands for human. You know, there's always a person at the back of that. Um, and I think, you know, I've been talking to some students this week, actually, um, undergraduates, and talking about how they can spot a, a good company to go and work for. And one of the big challenges is it's all very well talking about DEI and you might have a great DEI team and there could be 30 people in the DEI team. Um, but if the people outside of that team, the leaders, the managers in the business cannot talk uh, confidently about what DEI means to them, what it stands for, particularly the E, the equity part of things, you know, how are they opening doors, uh, then it's only skin deep. And I think good companies really, if you, you question management and leadership, they're able to talk confidently. They're not, you know, if, if you ask a leader, what, what does DEI mean to you? Why is it important? And they say, oh, you know, diversity of people is diversity of thought and better. They got that out of a book, very nice, but it doesn't mean anything. You, they've got to be able to talk with, with conviction, with passion, with humanity. Um, so I think that's what you see. I think ERGs, employee resource groups, are really crucial how much um, how much does a business put into their ERGs? You know, how much, how much are they taken notice of? Are they just something to say, we've got an ERG, but you never listen to them, you don't talk to them, you don't fund them? Um, or in the example there, you know, when you've got people in ERGs who are able to go out and be an ambassador for the business. So I think there are lots and lots of strands of, of what good looks like, but they only mean anything when you weave them together. Um, and, and, you know, some businesses will choose one or two strands and say, look at our, our beautiful tapestry. And, you know, I look at it and say, that's not a tapestry, that's, that's a ball of thread. You know, let, let's try and weave that together. Um, so but that's what I want to see. Uh, you sometimes see this um, effect where maybe the ERG is asked to lead on these topics, you know, and so you get a lot of energy from mm. staff, you know, really trying to do their best. But where, are, where is HR? Where are corporate leadership? Where are line managers? And uh, I, I think that's, that's an example, I suppose, of what you're... Yeah, you can, you can actually build frustration and tension there because you'll have very enthusiastic ERGs, generally because they are of the community that, that's being, being worked on, um, where they're feeling the business isn't behind them, they're not funding them, they're not supporting them. Um, and then, you know, the HR team are saying, well, it's, it's Trans Awareness Week, we'll, we'll, let's have a talk this week, you know, we'll go and organise a talk. And somebody's doing that off the edge of their desk. Um, again, it's not enough just to look at the calendar at the start of the year and say, okay, well, there's Lesbian Visibility Day, there's... Uh, Trans Awareness Week, there's, you know, Black History Month, you know, there's uh, Disability Awareness. You know, the, the world doesn't work like that, you know, trans people are trans people 365 days a year. You know, people who are disabled don't just suddenly after Disability Awareness Day get up and jump about and say, I'm no longer disabled. It's got to be a full-time job. Okay, so what I'm hearing so far is it's about there's there's the sort of foundational side there's the hard side of mm. uh, inclusion i suppose which is having the right policies and the framework around that but there's also the soft side the leadership side yeah. and um i think we're also hearing that it needs this joined up approach which includes the most senior leaders in in the organization but also includes hr also there's a space for ergs and for staff to lead uh and then getting to direct managers as well and then i think you were just saying um it's not a it's not a one week thing or a one month thing in the year. This is something that is actually more of a long term transformational thing that that has to be approached in a multi year a multi year journey. Okay, so that's that's I think some already some helpful building blocks. And um, Peter, you I think you, you were um, 
talking about the, the, the leadership gap, the space for leadership, you know, how would you think about some of what could a company do to put in place some of those foundational steps that Emily was referring to there? The microphone. There we go. Um, I think there is, so, so I would say this kind of two, so first of all, I would say that of the three people on this, or the four people on the panel, I'm probably, I probably have the least to add on this, but I think there might be some things to think about. I suppose we wouldn't want to overly focus on just the legal position, but I think that for HR, it's very important that everyone in the Institute understands and there's clear, uh, there's clear line management around those, sort of what, what are your legal obligations? But you mentioned the kind of the difference between hard and soft inclusivity policies. And I think it's the soft inclusivity policies where it can be really important and their relationship with the law. So you might be in a jurisdiction, for example, where because of somebody's gender identity or very often because of their sexual orientation, they're not entitled legally to parental benefits. And so one very, in, very one simple thing that you can do is you can extend your parental leave and your parental benefits policies to them, irrespective of their gender identity or of their, uh, uh, of their sexual orientation. <coughs> the second thing is that you might be in a jurisdiction where it is either impossible or very difficult for somebody to either legally amend their gender or to legally amend their name. So you have two things. You have inclusive policies internally, which allows people to be recognized in their lived name and gender, but also with HR, particularly if somebody's legal position is going to be different from how they are known and how they operate within the company, you put in place processes to ensure that there's not going to be an awkward, an awkward in the middle where HR are basically saying, well, what's the mismatch here, right? So you put in place just, and that's very simple, but that's some ways in which the internal company dynamics can circumvent a really difficult legal process. And then you can see things like, well, what are we not required to do? So for example, the law might not require you to have inclusive segregated space policies, inclusive restroom facility policies. And those can be things that as a company, you decide we're going to proactively do that. So I suppose it's less for me about thinking what does the company legally have to do and how do we ensure we're, we're complying with the law? And more thinking, listen, we're in a jurisdiction where there are legal gaps. And as long as we remain within the law, how can we adopt internal policies? And to a certain extent, we are going back to policies, but how do we adopt internal policies which allow us for our employees to be able to actually uh, remediate some of the problems where the law is failing? I think that's fascinating and actually because I mean this is your day job is the legal protections in this area internationally and I, th I, th I think I'm hearing you say it's necessary but not sufficient actually th uh, there's a lot that needs to be done there to make sure those legal protections are in place but actually true inclusion is is a, is a whole other side of the coin which um, which you're, you're also strongly recommending as an agenda that's that's very very helpful I think as well um, and I, I do want to say, we, we, before we finish, we'll definitely have time for questions from the audience. So if you have, if you have questions, please be thinking and we'll, we'll come uh, to, to the room in hopefully just a, a couple of minutes. Um, I mean, it, it could be the case that the room feels we're having a UK focused conversation. I, I, I don't know. Um, so, you know, what, one question in my mind is, well, what, what um, you know, what are the responsibilities for an organization to protect and include queer um, employees wherever they may be working in the world. And I don't know, Roger, if you've you've had experience of that or any sort of uh, thought, thoughts to add on that. Yeah, I mean, I've worked with some very large international organizations that have had presences in countries where there are almost no protections, right? The actual, the, the, the legal construct is actually the antithesis of protection, right? It's deport or jail or, or remove. And, uh, you know, it creates a, a very interesting conundrum because you know, sometimes you would think as a big corporate that wants to advocate, you know, inclusivity, et cetera, should you be operating in these countries, right? You know, have they made that choice to sort of explore the money over the, um, the sort of the, the, the thinking about the rights of others? But I suppose the other thing is sometimes, you know, the arguments that I have heard is people say that, well, actually, not being there is also not helpful because over time, you can sort of slowly but surely drip feed that sort of thing where if your employees do travel to such countries, you offer them protections, you know, obviously the office would be safe and depending on where it is. But again, there, I think that it, it, it's, it's not an easy answer uh, sometimes. 
I, I decided to pick up a point that Liam made earlier, so to keep talking about it. And I think if we, you know, as the, the big corporations, you know, address it and sometimes call it out, own it, right? Yeah, okay, we, we, we do have operations in countries that don't offer protections uh, to employees that we are proud of and want to have work for us. But the more we sort of talk about it, over time we can hopefully then start to educate people and change the way people think. Legislation and policy and things will come as well. But companies have big resources, right? They've got an opportunity. You know, they're doing business in countries and things like that. And at some points they can also influence, you know, local legislators and, 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 and certainly uh, create spaces for employees to work safely in those, those locations. No, that's that, that's all, and we we've, we've I mean we've got a very uh, global <coughs> footprint as a company, and we've um, you know for us it starts with being very clear with our clients that we will bring fully diverse teams to every client in every country we work in, as a as a ground rule, um, and um, and then beyond that um, we found it's quite valuable to have a we call it a segment of one focus, so really focusing on the needs of specific individuals who might be working in challenging. Uh, environments, um, but also building a broader movement for diversity within those offices so that um, there can be quite a loud, uh, positive uh, agenda that people can join in with and in particular activating allies as safe space uh, individuals that, that people can connect with and in the most difficult territories having actually emergency exit plans that we can activate very quickly, you know, if that were ever to be to be needed. Um, um, I, I don't know if anyone else wants to comment on that that perspective um, as well. But yeah, I don't know. I would just love to add, you know, everything you just mentioned. Um, I like from a very personal experience, I was able to see how that works when those things are not in place. I mean, I so often worked in countries where I just prayed I would never have to go to the hospital because I knew the company would never protect me. Right. And, um, or where, like for example, when I, when I worked in China in one area, there was this, um, I think the police there was very bored, so they had a lot of roadblocks, bl and there was a zero tolerance for driving with like being intoxicated, even if it was only 0, 0.1% or something. And what they would do as a rule is just arrest you if you had a certain tiny level of alcohol in your blood and throw you in jail overnight. And I just knew if that ever happens to me, I might not come out alive. And I knew my company would not protect me. And that is, that is puts enormous stress on a person to actually know that your life is in danger. And uh, you just sort of have to hope, okay, let's hope I never have to go to this hospital because maybe I won't be really taken well care of. And uh, that's why it's so important to have these, these things in place, have these policies, have a company that has your back, has these exit strategies. Yeah. It takes me back to that data at the beginning and just how important it is to walk in the shoes of people and understand what that daily, that daily life is like. Emily? Uh, I think I'd just add to that. I mean, that, that's a really important point. So when we think about international employees or employees traveling internationally, and, and as I do, it isn't just about the office space. It isn't just about what happens when you get in the office. That is so important. You, mm. You're right. You have to think about what happens if I fall ill. You know, where would I end up? I, I actually, I was on a, uh, a conference in Malta. Thank God it was Malta because it's the best queer-friendly country in Europe. Um, and I got COVID when it was just coming out. And I, I was locked in my hotel room. It was a great conference for me after one day. Um, but on day two, I started to feel very, very ill indeed. And even in a country that's very friendly, you start to think, what happens if I have to go to hospital? Where will I be taken? You know, what will my care be like? Will my business be there to support me? Because people were already going home from the conference. It is that, it's that extended element of work. You know, it's not just what happens nine to five in the office, as if any of us work nine to five. But you know, it's not that period. It's, it's everything that goes around it. And, that, and that's a really, mm. really important point. Or may I add just a tiny little thing like that? Something very simple like taxi vouchers. Like a little while back there, there I met somebody and, and a transgender woman and she got beaten up in the subway in the city where she worked several times and then wanted to have taxi vouchers always 
when she needed to go to the client. And she had to fight so hard for that because HR kept saying, yeah, no, but the policy is that you can only have that after 10 p.m. And she was like, yeah, but I need that all day long because I'm not safe. And they didn't understand that. And I think that's something so tiny where looking more at the individual than at the, you know, like rules is so much more important. It's a really good example. Thank you. So let's let's check in with the, the room and see if there are any burning questions um, yep. that we, we haven't yet uh, touched on. Um, and I have other questions I can ask if there aren't. Um, don't be shy. Uh, I see um, four hands, so I'm going to, uh, I don't know if we've got a roving mic, but maybe the, that, the hand nearest the, the mic on the right of the room would be great. I have so many burning questions for you. I think it's been <laughs> such an ancient well, I'll take notes, so okay, all right. <laughs> um, introducing myself again to the room, my name is Alma, my pronouns are she, they. Um, and it's so interesting to hear this discussion because I grew up in a lot of homophobic countries where that feeling of being unsafe and being out is both an upside and downside because on one on one part, you are someone for the community to speak to, know that you're there. And on the other side, you are just like the target for the onslaught of what everyone has to say. Um, and so with that, you have been discussing a lot about how businesses um, have their processes and fail to really see and understand what it is like for queer people, but at the same time want to show and showcase their diversity. And so I wanted to ask, how would, what are your thoughts on the use of tokenization instead of the celebration and how it affects and portrays um, a projection of false security for incoming new queer employees? Wow, that's a great thank question. You. No, thank you. And actually, I'm, thinking, I'm conscious we've just got so many brilliant people in the audience as well. So why don't we um, collect two or three, and then maybe we can, we can sort of come back to the panel for reflections. Um, I think there was another question, yes, at, and at the end of the same row, I think. Uh, hi, I'm Parkhi. I'm currently studying at LPS. My pronouns are she, her. And uh, similar to Ava, I as well grew up in countries that were extremely homophobic. And uh, thank you so much for being vulnerable today in this panel. I think we all needed that vulnerability to really show wh where we stand today as an industry. My question is uh, for Emily and Leon. You talked, about, you talked about your experiences of coming out and you talked about your experience of being trans. My question is, how has your trans journey changed or added to your definition of confidence? And how has this renewed definition of confidence formulated your competitive advantage in the workplace? That's a great, great question as well. Okay, and we'll see whether Liam Thank wants you. to also add any thoughts. Thank you. And then there was just one, I think there was one more hand on, on the other side of the room. Um, Two more, one here. One. Two, okay, perfect. Let's, let's uh, take those very quickly. Thank you. Hi, um, Matt Matthews, he, him, pronouns from PwC. Um, one of the tangible ways I think companies are failing queer employees is in the queer pay gap. How do we address that given the issues with population sizes and declaration rates? That's a whole panel as well. We can have <laughs> <after> this one. <laughs> thank you very much. Great question. And then one, I think one more on that row. Thank you. Hi. Um, from Accenture, originally from Argentina, but based in the UK. So. My personal perspective on this, rather than you know how companies are failing queer employees, is how companies are failing themselves by failing to recognize the impact that they can bring and the value that they generate. But specifically, you mentioned how you know some companies or you know groups only seem to care about the different groups at specific times of the year. There's a lot of, I guess, performative actions pink washing, publicity, without a deep understanding or care of the community, just you know, focused on looks more than depth. So I wanted to ask you what's your perspective on that? How do we get from performativism into actual transformative actions? And that uh, also joins up with that token tokenization question a bit as well. And I, I, I think maybe uh, Emily, Liam, we should just come to you for any sort of reflections on some of those questions. Um, I, I think um, my own experience has been that 
you know, there may be risk of tokenization um, in, in having some of these discussions, but actually that's a risk we have to run to get to the really deeper, authentic, lived experience of individuals, which I always find incredibly powerful when, when it connects with people at scale. So I, I don't, but I'd, I'd love to hear your perspectives on that. And also this question on, you know, reflecting on your journey and its, its impact on you. Yeah, so the, the tokenization one is interesting and, and you, you can as a, as a very visible, um, for me, a very visible trans by person, you can feel objectified sometimes that you are just wheeled out for the big days, you know, the poster comes out, hey, look, we're, we're really good. Um, and there is a risk of that. But then I think it is far, far outweighed by the fact that if I look back to when I started my career many, many years ago, um, there were no role models at all. There were no trans people anywhere. You just didn't see it at all. And that kept me in the closet for longer, frankly. That made me more miserable for longer. That led to nearly taking my own life twice. You know, th those are all real world uh, consequences of not having any visibility at all. Um, so, yes, it can tip over into the, yeah, you pop up, you know, once, twice a year and, and it's, yeah, yeah, Emily, and then off you go. I think where businesses can do better, because that's what we're here to talk about, is are you seeing trans, queer, black, disabled people appearing in the general business run of things? Are they publishing <coughs> white papers? Are they coming out when the, you're just talking about a day in the life of working at this organization? Are they speaking at conferences about the day job? Because guess what? You know, we're actually really good at our day jobs. I'm actually a really good P3O practitioner. You know, that's what I'd much rather be talking about. Uh, it's a lot less interesting, actually, but, you know, it's, it's something I have a passion for. Um, and I'll segue and then be quiet completely because you also asked about sort of the confidence and the journey. Um, very, in a very real sense, so uh, before I came out, you know, I've had to speak publicly for, for years and years. I've had to do these, not this sort of thing, but talking to large groups. Um, and I used to suffer with hyperidosis, so I would sweat so profusely, I'd have to go and change my shirt. I would be prone to panic attacks. I would really struggle. And nobody knew because I covered it up and, and you know, I would be clenching my fists. Um, the minute I came out, literally the minute I came out, and even before social transition, it's just stopped. It's never happened again. So there's a very physical manifestation there of, of, of what that confidence has meant to me. Um, but it's also meant that I feel authentic all the time. I, I don't know how much, there's probably a neuroscientist will try and tell me, how much brain power I was using to hide my identity. You know, whether that be just in mannerism, whether that be in comment, whether that be something fundamental like, did I leave a scrap of nail polish on from the weekend when I was alone and, and, and being me in private, which, which was the case for so many years. You're thinking about that all the time. Did I leave an item of clothing in the back of the car? Did, you know, whatever it might be. And that, that's just not good for you. And that hits your confidence. And it means you're not authentic. The, the best leaders, the only way to be a leader is to be authentic. Because you know what? Most people can see straight through you if you're not authentic. And they'll assume the worst. They'll assume actually it's not that you're just hiding your trans. They'll assume that you're just a liar or there's some other problem with you. Uh, and that in business becomes a real issue. So Thank that's, you. that's me. Thank you. Liam, any final thoughts? Uh, yeah. Um, so to the tokenization aspect, I think I'm always very mindful of that. But it, it makes a little bit of a difference for me. Like, I don't mind sort of being the token person if I see that I'm being taken serious and I'm also allowed to have an impact and drive change as long as that is the case, I'm very happy to be a token person <laughs> because, yeah, like Elliot said, there is really this, I mean, if we have the chance to make a difference, then I think we should, well, I should grab it. Um, and um, the other uh, question about the confidence, I mean, for me, it's been a very, very long process, but I think going through so many challenges, and in my case, being trans is only one of many problems, like I was also orphaned at birth and grew up with very difficult adoptive parents and and then, of course, like started realizing I was trans at a time when nobody was really talking about it 
or hearing about it or knowing about it. So I used to be incredibly insecure. Um, and over the years, it's been something I've been fighting for very hard. I really have built a solid self-confidence. And now, yeah, you can basically throw anything at me and I'll somehow deal with it, <laughs> be that on a private level or on a business level. Thank you. Thank you. I know we have to wrap up now. I can see people literally waving at me from the back <laughs> of the room. So um, maybe just one, one sentence, you know, so some absolutely fantastic emerging talent in this room and they're about to, you know, soon go into an organization most likely, whether it's a startup or a corporate or any other NGO. What would you say one, you know, in one sentence, you know, to, to have in mind that, that they can do to make a difference? Am I going to go first? Oh, that's not my sentence. <laughs> well, maybe that is a sentence. Go for it. I think the thing for me is, you know, just listen to your own inner voice, trust yourself, uh, you know, and over time, look for those that inspire and aspire. You know, you can be the leaders of tomorrow. You are the leaders of tomorrow. I was going to say, don't do a PhD, graduate school is a trap. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and obviously I don't work in, so, so, so I suppose my only thing would say is that like, you know, I have been, I have always found uh, being out, uh, I work in a law school where there's not actually a huge number of queer people and I've always found being out actually to be really sort of, to actually be really sort of self-fulfilling. Um, I found it to be really, uh, to actually to make my job a lot easier and I, I really do empathise with the point that's been made by, by both of my colleagues here and the, that actually being out at work has made me a much happier, more productive individual. Um, so that's what I would just sort of say as a personal experience. But I'm in academia, I'm not in company, so I have very little to say. Liam, and Emily, any final sentence? Um, well, one of our leads in CE said something beautiful in LinkedIn a little while ago. And he said that don't go where you're merrily accepted, go where you're celebrated. And I would say, yeah, do that. <laughs> and I'd say claim your space, hold your space. Um, leadership for me is all about moral courage. Uh, and courage is contagious. So if you hold your space, behave courageously, uh, that is contagious, and that will make a better workplace for you and for the people that you aspire to lead. And, and a, a bit the same, I mean, I, I'd say, don't underestimate the power you have at any stage of your career. Um, you know, how you show up at work is in itself an act of leadership, cultural leadership, and um, you know, you all have agency, you all have privilege, that you can use to advance our community and, and other communities in the workplace and um, um, you know, all power to you. So with that, um, I, I, I want to say thank you to the panel, but I am going to hand over to Abe, who, um, uh, <laughs> who will help close the, close the session. Thank you. Well, I wanted to say thank you to the panel. I thought this was an amazing discussion. So. Thank you.